Your pet won't stop itching. What's wrong? Well, itchiness could mean your furry friend has allergies. Dry and itchy skin caused by allergies is a common problem in animals year round. And on this episode of the Paul Report, we're joined by veterinarian Dr. Jason Peeper. He'll help us diagnose the itch and explain how we can help our pets manage those annoying allergies. Stay with us. Fetcher's Pet Supply on the north side of the Charleston Square, serving the EIU community since 1991. Fetcher's welcomes all pets on a leash, is open seven days a week, and offers made in the USA food. Pet supplies for dogs, cats, reptiles, and fish. Fetcher's Pet Supply in Charleston. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Your dog has the itch. Well, no, not necessarily to go outside or to get a treat. Maybe there's something a little bit deeper than that. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Paul Report. I am your host, Kelly Goodwin, and we have a very special guest with us today. We are joined by Dr. Jason Pieper with the University of Illinois, uh, a veterinary extraordinaire in the field of dermatology. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. I always like to introduce uh, new guests that have been on The Paul Report by having them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about you. Yeah. So, as you said, Jason Pieper. I'm from Nebraska originally. Um, I'm kind of a Midwesterner at heart and went to Iowa State for vet school. And after some training, I came to the University of Illinois to do my residency. And I, that was back in 2011. And after finishing my residency since 2015, I've stayed on as a faculty member here. So I do a variety of seeing patients on a regular basis and also teaching students all, everywhere from first year, second year, third year, all the way up to the fourth year on the clinic floor. Um, so that's kind of the majority of my job there. And I really like veterinary dermatology because it kind of brought two things that I enjoyed in my past, which was using a microscope on a regular basis, <laughs> which is very fun to me. Um, but then also from a specialty standpoint, a lot of my clients have been my clients for seven or eight years. And so I get to know them, know about their family and everything mm -hmm. like that. So I get that real, real strong personal connection with them. And, you know, because in my opinion, the animal is part of the family. So I kind of treat the whole family and it, I really enjoy that about my job. So. Well, we're filming here in the middle of summer. And as we tried to coordinate our time together, you had clinicals this morning. So you are very active in the office and very active in the classroom. Allergies are also very active. How common are allergies in animals? Yeah, it's quite variable depending upon the species. Probably the one most study is dogs, and that's anywhere from 10 to 20% is kind of what some people will discuss. Um, I believe it's probably a little bit higher, and I think some people just don't recognize it because it's very mild. Like, you know, myself, I have a little bit of eczema, which is kind of allergy kind mm -hmm. of, you know, entity there but you know a lot of people might have a little bit of that and I think animals do as well and maybe the owner gives them antihistamines or something just to keep the itch kind of under control every once in a while and I don't think they truly attribute that to hey my animal does have allergies. But. Mm -hmm. Are they just seasonal? I mean is it something where an animal might be itchy scratchy in the spring and oh it'll pass you know if if someone has a pet oh by June it's it's over with and then they're fine for the next six months yeah it, it depends on the type of allergy definitely you know we have the three big allergies we always talk about which flea allergy is one um, environmental allergy or atopic dermatitis which is the highest one that I mentioned at 10 to 20 percent um, and then food allergies so environmental allergies they usually are seasonal to some degree, but there are some that have year-round allergies, um, whether it's something that's in the house that they're allergic to, and but then maybe they also have a little bit of corn pollen allergen, so 
come kind of fall time when they're harvesting, they get a little bit itchier and start to have a little bit more problems. Um, so it is a variety. They can be year round all the time the same, or they can just exacerbate in certain seasons. So you, you just mentioned a couple of causes and that was my next question, but I'm sure that there's a laundry list of what can cause um, allergies. And you mentioned the three main types, the flea base, the environmental and the food. But I think each of those, we could probably go in a little bit deeper and talk about them individually on what could cause them. Yeah, yeah, definitely like flea allergies, it's definitely the bite of them biting and causing problems. Um, dogs can be very specific in how they look. Cats, I will say they're kind of a little bit more troublesome to deal with because all three of their allergies kind of look very similar. So it's not necessarily the dog, it's very common the back area kind of around their you know, back of their legs, we kind of call them the pants region, more mm -hmm. or less, where they'd wear pants is where they're really having problems, where cats, it's kind of all around. Um, food allergies, definitely one big misnomer that a lot of people don't know is that 90 to 95% of food allergies is actually to the protein. It's not to the grains, even though a lot of people think about that because they anthropomorphize their animals and think they're like us and they have, you know, a wheat allergy or a corn allergy where that's actually the minority, five to 10% of cases. Um, and then environmental allergies or atopic dermatitis, that actually is broken down, you know, depending what it is. We commonly will do testing for grasses, trees, and weeds, which is what most people think of, but there's a lot of inside things that are like house dust, house dust mites. Um, I've had many animals that were allergic to wool, and unfortunately the owners had wool carpets or wool rugs, you know, and things like that. So obviously it's something inside the house. Um, cotton can also be a common one that we can deal with. So there's, yes, there's a lot of different little subsets within each group, more or less. But. Do animals develop their allergies as puppies or kittens? Um, or is it something that as they get older, I mean, adult dogs can, can also come down with uh, allergic reactions to different things? Yes, th the majority of them are younger, yes. There's most of the time it's either between six months up to, for environmental allergies, up to three years. Food allergies is typically a year and a half or younger. Um, so most of them are gonna be younger. Food allergies, they can actually manifest when they're older too. So that is a little bit different, but most of the time, yes. When they're younger, they start to have allergies. Um, but as mentioned before, it may be just a little bit of paw licking and the owners give some antihistamines and everything's fine. But as they progress years down the road, next thing you know, it's not just a little paw licking, it's licking both paws, scratching their undersides, chewing their belly, things like that. So they become more severe with time. And that's what we commonly see with environmental allergies is that they kind of progress from maybe originally seasonal to year round. And then they also increase in severity usually with age as well. Have you noticed over time since our environment has changed um, that allergies are becoming more prevalent in animals? I think, yes, definitely. There, it does become a little more prevalent and I think it also comes down to education too. I think people are more aware of that and the more that we think of them as a member of the, the house and a member of the family. It's not, you know, a lot of people see them itching and licking or chewing and I'll have some owners and I'll be like, oh, are they itching really bad? And they're like, yes. I'm like, oh, how bad? And they're like, I saw him lick three times yesterday, <laughs> which, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of a dog thing. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so some people become a little bit hyper aware of it because they are part of the family and they don't want anything going bad and getting worse, more or less. Um, so some are a little bit, you know, a little hyper intense to it. Um, definitely there are region differences though. And we have a lot of students that come down from the Chicago area and they come down to Champaign-Urbana for vet school and they didn't have bad allergies up in Chicago. But when they come down to our area where there's a lot more pollen mm -hmm. due to farming and everything, they are significantly worse. Can your animal have both um, environmental allergies and food allergies? I mean, can, can they overlap? And I guess that would be some pretty severe cases if, if, that's, if that can happen. Yes, yes, they definitely can have both, if not all three, and I've seen several that have that. Um, and those are definitely the more severe cases, but it may start out as, yes, they're showing signs of food allergies from a very young age, um, which can also not just skin-wise itching, chewing, but they can also have soft bowel movements, they can be gassy, 
burping a lot, stuff like that, that can be signs of food allergies. And then next thing you know, they're like, oh, now they're itching really bad in the spring and really bad in the fall. And they have both. And then it's a matter of, yes, it's not just nice and easy. One thing we deal with, we have to deal with multiple different aspects for diagnosis as well as treatment. I, that was leading me into the next question on is itchiness, it, it, there's other signs of allergies. I mean, they don't. it doesn't just come in the form of itchiness, licking paws, um, there's seat scooting, there's a lot of different things that take on this problem. What are some of the other symptoms that you see? Yeah, typically for, for food allergies, I guess I'll kind of go each group more or less, but food allergies, they start off with the bowel movements, gastrointestinal signs, as well as ear infections and scooting, like you mentioned before, because they're their perianal area is kind of itchy. So that's kind of the initial signs for them. Um, so it's not necessarily like scratching at the ears, it could just be infection, which could be odor and stuff like that. Environmental allergies, yes, itching is predominant, but they can just get recurrent infections. They can get bacterial infections, hair loss, crusting, stuff like that on their skin. And then that could be indicative that there is something abnormal underlying and we have to address that to kind of get it under control. Um, flea allergies typically will be itching predominant, but they can get hair loss um, and whatnot. The other downside is, especially when I talk about cats, is cats are kind of closet lickers, <laughs> you know, so they go and hide and even some dogs will do that too. If you, you know, scold them enough and tell them stop looking, right. stop scratching, then next thing you know, they go hide underneath the bed and you can hear the bed kind of vibrating because they're scratching and licking underneath there. So they will do that and it may not be extremely obvious to the owner and that's where we look at the other signs as well. People out there watching may, may ask, okay, so my dog, cat, have some of the very things that you're talking about. How do you diagnose the itch? Is it a series of tests? Is it skin tests, blood tests? Is it similar to what we as humans go through? Yeah, so it's similar in a way, yes. Um, for flea allergies, obviously we find signs of fleas. Um, and having the area affected, you know, that's pretty straightforward for flea allergies. Food allergies, unfortunately, to diagnose it, we have to do a food trial, which is a strict food trial of no other medications that are flavored, no treats that are flavored. They get a food, a prescription diet only, anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, and then we notice the improvement of their itching or clinical signs, and then at the end of that time, we can give them their old stuff, and then all of a sudden, they get worse. Um, environmental allergies is a little bit tougher. It's kind of more or less, we call it a diagnosis of exclusion. So we kind of rule out all the other things that cause itching, which goes along with bacterial infections, yeast infections, fleas, we already mentioned, um, along with, you know, parasites. There can be parasites that can be in the skin that can be affecting them. So we kind of rule those out along with food allergies. Once we rule those out, I kind of tell people we back ourselves in the corner of, yes, very likely atopic dermatitis or environmental allergies. Um, we do have skin tests and prick tests, you know, and even blood tests that are out there. Um, but the downside of those is that they can be false positive, positives with them. So even though they may be showing signs of that, a positive test doesn't necessarily mean that they in fact have environmental allergies. Um, and I've seen that with several studies that I've done as well as read other ones that normal dogs walking around there not itching whatsoever can have positive results. Mm. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine very recently. Uh, his daughter ha is allergic, has a gluten, she has to, she's gluten free. Um, is that something that we can translate into our pets? Do they have similar allergies? Like, we, you know, gluten now is what everybody's talking about. Yes, yeah, and there's there's a very small subset that will have gluten allergies, um, a very specific breed typically, but it is not common, you know, for mm. the most part. Um, again, we usually say with the proteins, you know, we think for proteins, it's typically the chicken, the beef, lamb, you know, we're starting to get fish as well, dairy, you know, those are kind of the bigger ones that we think of when it comes to food intolerance or food allergies. I'm a pet owner. What, what do you do? So what should pet owners do? They have an animal, they've, you've diagnosed it. How can we manage it at home? What do we need to do? Environmental seems like, that seems very difficult, very yeah. challenging because you can't control if you live in an environment where there's farming all around you. 
exactly. And there's, there are rare cases that, yes, if you find something they're allergic to, like I mentioned before, wool allergies, and I had one owner that the dog loved to lay on a wool rug. <laughs> found out they're positive to wool allergies. We take away the rug. The dog did significantly better. But yes, the vast majority you can't avoid. So it's a matter of there's a variety of medications that can act in different ways to decrease the itching, decrease the inflammation that goes on the side with them clinically. Um, and then there's also, kind of like with humans, allergy shots. And that's, you know, kind of more or less, we call them desensitization shots, where it just changes the body's immune system so it doesn't react and it doesn't go kind of out of control with environmental allergies. So that's kind of, you know, probably one of the most pure treatments by far. Mm -hmm. so. Food you can change too. I mean, once you kind of pinpoint whatever food might be causing their their issue, you can remove that from their diet potentially. Exactly, and, and most of the time with dogs with food allergies, you'll find out what they're allergic to, even if you get them on a strict diet and they are doing well, they will challenge themselves. They will get into the trash. They will be like my house has a five-year-old, a three-year-old, <laughs> and a six-month-old, and food drops on the floor, and all of a sudden they become itchier. So you kind of identify those things. Um, usually it's a few different proteins. It's not usually hey, seven or eight different proteins are allergic to it. Usually it's a handful, one, two, three. Um, so as long as you avoid those, those dogs do very well. And then flea allergies for those, flea medications is the best way just to avoid getting infestation, so. Avoid them is good, but yes. what if the pet owner neglects the signs? Um, a pet owner sees their dog scratching, a lot. ah, they'll get over it. Licking a lot, ah, they'll get over it. Yeah, they're a part of the family, but you know, they'll be okay. What if? What if you don't treat it and you let it continue and you let it fester? Yes, You've they, seen cases, I'm sure. Oh yes, definitely, yes. They, they can get obviously horrible infections like I mentioned before. And infection usually is not a big deal. We can treat those and clear those up. But then there's now, of course, just like in human medicine, the very resistant bacterial infections, which we deal with a lot. Um, so they are, you can treat them without a problem, but they may take you know, a more stronger antibiotic, um, more intensive, you know, topical care, things like that. Um, and then probably the worst case scenario with the chronic inflammation in the skin is that there is a belief and some correlation with some studies of increased risk of autoimmune disease development within the skin, as well as cancer of the mm. skin, just due to the chronic inflammation. And unfortunately, yes, I have seen those cases that had horrible environmental allergies that were not addressed for years and they developed cutaneous lymphoma. And mm. so then that's unfortunately a really bad. That's deadly. Know, plastic I mean, it disease. can be. Yes. Yes. Well, it, let's say somebody has allergies themselves and they open up their medicine. Ca oh, I always take that when I'm feeling a little itchy or I have a lot of bug bites. I'll just give it to Fido too. I, I'm assuming um, that that's not the right thing to do. Don't give your pet what you may be taking for your allergies, even if it's over the counter. Correct, yeah, and, and big part of the reason is because they're, again, totally different species and they metabolize drugs, some much faster than us, some much slower than us, and of course, some can cause toxic signs. Um, especially, probably the biggest thing I would say is you'll, you'll hear a lot of them with decongestants, like antihistamines with decongestants or whatever, and that can actually cause severe side effects with animals. So there are definitely a lot of human ones that they should not. So I definitely recommend them talking to their vet. There are over-the-counters that they can try and that can be safe, but find out the correct dosing and the correct medication to use because otherwise you may cause more severe problems. So, In my research uh, before our discussion today, I was, I was doing some reading on acute allergic reaction. Uh, what What is that? I and mean, can you go into detail and explain what happens if if an animal experiences that in taking and treating their problem. Yeah, and there's a variety of things that encompass the acute allergic reactions. Could be something as simple as you used a detergent and that was on their bedding and they laid on it and they just really broke out, really red and flamed um, and intensely itchy and things like that, um, which obviously something like that, if you know what the cause is, you just remove it. Um, some can be, they went through and touched a flower or whatnot, you know, mm -hmm. there's some of those that the pollen on those can be highly inflamed. Um, so there are different things like that. And there's even some, an area we call acute moist dermatitis, which usually those dogs have allergies already. Hot spots is the, the mm -hmm. common term we use for them. Um, they usually have some sort of allergy that they come in contact with and then they rip themselves apart and then they become very oozing and exudative and 
get really bad infections and unfortunately they're really painful and they cause a lot of intense itching with those cases so are certain breeds more prone to being susceptible to allergies big dogs medium-sized dogs sporting dogs you yeah. know it's, the littler dogs, the the poodles, the, that sort of thing, the Cairn Terriers. Yeah, it's pretty widespread amongst them. There are definitely the poster childs, I will say, you know, of West Highland White Terriers have always been one of the biggest ones talked about. Pit bulls, which I see a lot and I personally have, and she's horribly allergic. Um, and I see a lot of allergic pit bulls around. Um, Labs. Labs, definitely. Golden Retrievers, definitely. Um, Cocker Spaniels, definitely, are another breed. Um, there is just a large, large variety of them. As you start to look more and more at the studies, there's now about 15 to 20 different breeds that are predisposed. And, and you know, people, it, it seems like in the last, you know, I don't want to put a time stamp to it, but they're turning to the the dogs that are the non-shedding dogs, the Labradoodles of the world. Are they prone to allergies as well? I mean, I know they're not shedders like your traditional lab or golden retriever, but I, I would have to believe that they can suffer from allergies too. Yes, yes, there's definitely, you know, the poodles don't typically have a lot of allergies, but of course you bring in the golden or the Labrador that kind of brings in some other hereditary aspects. And then the other thing is sometimes it has nothing to do with the breed whatsoever. Um, hmm. It could just be, there's some studies looking at if the animals have been raised, you know, in an urban city, they're more likely to have allergies versus rural. Maybe the whole hygiene hypothesis of them not being exposed to allergens when they're young, that their body reacts to normal pollen and things like that, that they shouldn't. So there's a wide variety. So it's not just with the breed specifically, but yes, we do see it with some of the designer breeds quite commonly, unfortunately. What about um, going back to, we talked about food allergies and we can't tell our viewers, hey, go out and buy this product or buy this kind of food, but is there something specific maybe in the ingredient list that people can look for? Like I, you know, I, I've got a new puppy. I want to do is I, I want to start off on the right foot. I want to get the best food. I want to make sure that they're safe and healthy. Anything we should look for in, in that yeah, for, area? For food allergies, it's kind of tough because it's protein based. Um, the over-the-counter products that you find everywhere where everybody buys them from. Um, they're not the greatest to do for food trials because they can be contaminated in the processing in the plant. Um, but what I usually tell people is don't switch proteins all the time because when we do a food trial, we usually do a novel protein, a lot of people will, and novel being something they've never been exposed to. So if you're mm -hmm. switching bags every single month, they've been exposed to a lot in the past, um, and that could be a problem. But obviously the diets that are limited in proteins and have just one versus five different ones, that can be a little bit better for them maybe just in case there is one of the other ones they're allergic to. Um, so for food allergies, there's that aspect. For environmental allergies, a lot of times I will recommend like a fish-based diet, like a salmon-based diet, because it has the oils that can really help with the skin, moisturize the skin, and kind of help build up that abnormal mm -hmm. barrier they have in their skin. Um, so those diets can help, and not only that, the fish oils can help for anti-inflammatory effects as well. So fish diets, I think, are very good. beneficial. Yes, for environmental allergies, they they can do nothing but help, unless, the, fortunately, if they have food allergies to the fish. Yeah. Then, so. <laughs> well, we've got about a minute left, and um, I'm curious to, to hear what you have to say about maybe a success story, uh, maybe a client that, that you've dealt with recently that, boy, you just kind of shook your head and said, I just don't know, and, and they're running around and happy as can be now. Yeah, yeah, actually, there's a patient I saw last week, and, you know, like I said, I've been there since 2011, and we actually were doing the math, and we're like, oh, we've seen them for, I've seen this patient for seven and a half years, which is kind of that long-standing relationship I ha talked about, and I see him twice a year, um, and they made a comment to me at the appointment the other day, they're like, you know, she was in bad shape when we first saw you, you know, we thought that we were going to have to put her down because her allergies were just so severe. She was ripping herself apart all the time, not happy, did not have a good quality of life and lots of infection. Where now she's very happy, 
now starting to become a little senior citizen, uh -huh. but that's, that's, that's right. natural. That's the way it should be. Um, but she was doing great and they couldn't be happier at this point. And those are the things that make me extremely happy to make come to you work smile as yes. you are right now. Yes. Dr. Jason Pieper from the University of Illinois, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. I actually learned many things today. I mean, I knew that there were allergies out there, but um, to pinpoint them and to say the wool, I, I would have never, I would have never guessed that. But there's probably a lot of things in your home that you don't think about. Yes. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and, and answering a few questions for us today on the yeah. Paul Report. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Paul Report. Again, I am your host, Kelly Goodwin and we'll see you next time. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Power Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Fetcher's Pet Supply on the north side of the Charleston Square, serving the EIU community since 1991. Fetcher's Welcomes All Pets on a Leash is open seven days a week and offers made in the USA food. Pet supplies for dogs, cats, reptiles, and fish. Fetcher's Pet Supply in Charleston. Additional support for the Paw Report on WEIU is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.